Shabbat Shalom. Last week, our congregation went on a trip to see Fiddler on the Roof at the, uh, the Lyric Opera. It was a beautiful production. It's very well done in every way. One of the themes that came to me um, from seeing it this time was looking at Tevye as a working class Jewish hero. Right, Tevye is not rich in money. He's not learned. Although he quotes a good book all the time, though it's not exactly the same as the good book we usually use, but it's a good book in his head. But yet he's rich in many other ways. He's got a feeling for a tradition and um, we hear from the beginning how he wants to marry his daughters to uh, a learned, to learned men, uh, boys. And then when he's saying about wishing that he was rich, the end of all that song is he wishes he had the place in the synagogue where he could learn and study and pray and all of that. And he's wealthy in love. He has five daughters who all adore him and his wife too in her way. And he has a place in the community. And he's also wealthy in good sense. He has common sense to think up the dream to convince his wife. Of, uh, and he has an open heart, an open heart to his daughter's love. Um, and his first one to the tailor and then so on. And he's even willing to bend tradition for that love. He's willing to change uh, because he understands that what's in the heart is very important. And we see him throughout the whole production, wrestling with all the different forces of play, with tradition, honoring his daughters. And he may not be learned, but as we see more and more, he does have a certain seichel, a certain um, mind or intelligence and a profound humanity. He's just a, a struggling Jew, anonymous, but who loves his tradition, does not have time to study it, but who speaks to God in familiar ways are reminiscent of how the Hasidim would talk to God. Couldn't you have chosen someone else for a change? And who turns to God over and over in moments of crisis with a little bit of quetching, with, but also with a lot of good humor and a, a certain kind of grace. And he finds himself just caught between society changing and all these different pulls and a person who's open to being in dialogue. Right, Tevye is not a rabbi. He's not a learned man. He's not a scholar. He's not a medieval poet. He's not a secular prodigy as we've had so many in our, of our people or Babylonian exile, but what he does represent are the endless numbers of Jews throughout 2,000 years of exile and beyond who have carried our people through so much, despite the dangers to their lives, continuing to follow the precepts of our people, stubbornly living the traditions, often in extreme poverty, and refusing to let go of their identity, wandering from nation to nation, generation to generation. And yet despite all those conditions, the horses that become lame, the pogroms, they still find that place of open heart and humor, laughing at the world, trying to do Shabbos, trying to talk to their God, arguing with their tradition and their God, but also carrying in their own way the yoke of the tradition while trying to give a meal at the table for anyone who comes. And so in our reading this week, begins with the, the words, the marking the renewal of the covenant. You stand this day, all of you, before your God, your tribal heads, your elders, and your officials, every householder, your children, your wives, even the stranger within your camp, from wood chopper to water drop, to enter into the covenant of your God, which your God is concluding with you. This day. So the Torah is painting, painting a very broad picture of everybody who's included. Everybody is included and in giving you different positions, different uh, people who have different statuses in society and different professions. You may wonder why of all the professions, they say the, the wood chopper and the water carrier. Why of all 
why evolved and they mentioned those two. And so the commentators, they explained, these were not the highest positions in the ancient society. These were simple uneducated Jews, but it was they too were included in the plan. Others explained maybe they were the Gershonites or one of a, a plan with a low status. But others say, who was the wood chopper? The wood chopper was the one who had the lowliest profession among the men. And who was the water carrier, the water drawer? That was the lowliest profession among the women. And so they were called by name because they were considered completely equal in the covenant with every single other Jew on that day and on every day. And in the Hasidic thinking, they point out if you count all the names of all those different parts of society that's mentioned, you come up to 10. And 10 represents the number of completedness, the sifirot up in the heavens and all the, the, the divine uh, energies that make up all of life. And teaching us that every single one is an essential component. Every single one is part of the whole, has their place, part of that unity. And perhaps the Torah also knew at that moment that there would be times when the leaders would not be able to lead, or the elders would be too preoccupied with themselves. And at that point, truly, it would be the wood choppers and the water carriers, the women and the children and the elderly who would carry the weight of our people and the covenant on their shoulders. And even back then, understanding the covenant was took a matter of education and of knowledge. Right? Even in biblical times, there were hundreds of laws and complicated ideas. One can imagine that the water carrier and the wood chopper didn't always have the time to really understand what exactly was being um, reasoned, but they did their best to follow it. And they found their place in the covenant with their own kind of devotion and wisdom. And we see this through history from Eastern Europe to Spain and Morocco and Iraq, to all the farmers and craft people and tailors. They're the ones who also did not lose their faith in the covenant. And even when they didn't understand it, they still found comfort and solace as best they could. And there is this, a Hasidic story about the holidays of a young boy who's told about Yom Kippur and how the powerful and beautiful, majestic day it is. A day of fasting, but also of forgiveness. So he wanders and he comes into the service, but he can't follow any of the prayers. and doesn't understand where they are or what's happening. He has a little flute in his pocket and he suddenly says, well, I want to join in too. So he takes out his flute and starts playing his flute. And everybody's aghast took an instrument out on Yom Kippur. But the story goes, the person leading the service to the Baal Shem, who was the founder of the Hasidic movement, stopped and he said, up until now, all of our prayers were stuck in this room. But his little flute playing unlocked the gates to the heaven. And sometimes that's just the spirit we need to unlock all of our prayers for all of us. And so in these days before Rosh Hashanah, we celebrate the place of every one of us, of every Jew in the covenant, everyone who has wrestled with it, everyone who has tried to find their place. And to remember that what is most desired is the sincerity in our hearts, the broadness of our compassion, our resolve to carry the yoke of our tradition, the value for other human beings. Shabbat Shalom.